All right, so uh, thanks for that, Brother Caleb. That was uh, Psalm 32, so that's where I'll be taking the message from this morning. Um, The title of the sermon is The Forgiveness of Sins. Um, So we saw there in uh, in Psalm 32, verse 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will impute, imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So if you turn to Romans verse uh, chapter 4, we're going to spend quite a bit of time in Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> so we'll be coming back to it as well. But in Romans 4.1, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So we heard uh, Pastor Kevin preach on this last week, and I agree with him on his position on when Abraham was saved. It was when the Lord appeared to him in Mesopotamia, uh, according to Acts chapter 7. So he believed well before he was circumcised, you know, well before he had been asked to sacrifice Isaac, and even before he left the land he was in. Um, you know, and salvation's always been and always will be by grace through faith in the Lord. Whether it was to Abraham, it was the Lord God Almighty. To some it was the Lord Jehovah, and for us it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same Lord overall, the Son of God from everlasting. So stay in chapter 4 of Romans, but I'll read to you from Acts 13, verse 38. It says, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So by him, that's Jesus Christ, all that believe are justified from all things. So it's by Jesus we receive the forgiveness of sins. And it's because he took our sins on the cross, our sin is not imputed unto us. You know, so the law could not justify you in the sight of God. You know, and you can't make it any more clear that the Old Testament believers were all saved in the exact same way. It was never by the deeds of the law and it never can be. So you're in Romans, if you want to turn over to Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So back in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, it makes it very clear here, But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So again, uh, Paul's quoting here from, from Psalm 32. He's quoting what David said. And uh, it just shows there's no works salvation in the old testament david understood he was saved by his faith Uh, without works he understood that all men are saved without works by the faith in jesus christ Um, and abraham believed god and it was counted unto him for righteousness and we'll continue in romans 4 just down to verse 13 it says for the promise that he should be the heir of the world this is to abraham was not to abraham or to his seed through the law that's the law of moses but through the righteousness of faith. For they which are of the law be as faith is made void and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not that only which is of the law, but also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So Abraham's the father of us all, And it says we have that same assurance as his seed because it's by faith and not of works of the law. We'll continue in verse 17. It says, As I have written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who according hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, 
and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. So Abraham, his faith was counted for righteousness and the righteousness of Christ was imputed unto him. You know, just as it says it's imputed unto us, in James 2.23 it says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So you stay in Romans 4. I'm just going to read a couple of uh, a couple more statements here. One from Psalms and two from Hebrews. Uh, Psalms 103 verse 12. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Hebrews 8 12, he says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10 verse 16 says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So all these promises are to the new man. He is without sin, and he's born of God. You know, and this is what it means to have the righteousness of Christ imputed unto you. And you know, he's the one who's going to stand in the judgment and be found perfect, just as Christ was perfect. So, but how is it imputed unto us? Is it by works? It's not by the works of the law. We've seen that very clearly. It's by faith. Your faith is the only thing that saves you. So we skipped over Romans 4 verse 4, but uh, go back there now. It says, Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So it says he's a debtor to do the whole law. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, He's guilty of all. He's guilty of the whole law. And this is the problem we see in the Galatian church. So I'll get you to turn to Galatians chapter 1. And it's a problem that exists in a lot of churches, uh, but it comes in different forms. We'll get to that later. So starting in verse 6 in Galatians chapter 1, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So early on we see that there were already false teachers bringing another gospel, adding the works of the law, in this case it was circumcision, to the gospel of Christ. So it brings me to the next point, which is those who teach another gospel who have a false way. So in Galatians chapter 2, if you just want to turn over the page, Verse 3, he says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us under bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, known not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So they didn't even bear with these guys, not even for an hour. You know, and that's the same way we should be as well. When someone comes in preaching another gospel, we don't even bear with them for an hour. Amen. We'll continue in verse 6. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat, in conference, added nothing to me. So you notice what he calls those who came in to spy out the liberty and to bring you back into bondage? He calls them false brethren. You know, so these are not those who are believed, but these are the ones who believe in a false gospel coming under the guise of somebody who believes, but they believe in the works of their own hands. And their purpose is to frustrate the grace of God, to bring confusion and bondage to God's people. So we need to be aware of them. Uh, back in Galatians 2, verse 16, 
It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. I want you to pay attention to that. We're justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live under God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I want you to pay attention to that as well. We live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So this is the problem with the false brethren in the Galatian church, teaching others to go back to the law for perfection. You know, so by doing that, they make themselves a transgressor of the law. Because if we're under grace, you know, we don't need to be under the law because we're under grace. And we're made perfect in Christ. Um, you know, and in this case, it was the circumcision of the flesh um, that they were struggling with. But they didn't understand that it was only a picture of the circumcision of the heart, the one made without hands. So I'll get you to turn to First Timothy chapter 1. And we'll see here who the law is made for. So if you walk in the spirit, the law is not made for you. If you walk after the old man, the law is still profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. And that's why Paul says to Timothy about using the law lawfully. I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, um, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So reading in 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And that's exactly what these false brethren and false teachers are. These are people who are, you know, they're nothing but vain jangling. They're desiring to be teachers of the law, but they don't even understand what they're saying. They don't understand what they're affirming. You know, it's because they're not saved. They can't understand the spiritual things of God. So in verse 8 it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now who's the new man, the one that's born of God? That's a righteous man. The law is not made for him. The law is made for the following people, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. Uh, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the gospel, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So again, if you're walking after the spirit, then the law is not made for you. But if you're walking after the flesh and you're doing some of these things, you know, then the law can be used for correction. Um, that's using the law lawfully. So that brings me to another point. You know, not only are they false teachers and false brethren which teach any gospel that's not by faith alone in Christ alone, without works, but there's also a group of people who will say it's by faith alone, but they'll demand evidence for your salvation or they'll demand that you keep yourself saved through works. So, you know, and we know it's not evident by works. At best, it's evident by the words that you speak. But the, the truth is, that the only evidence you have is the Holy Spirit testifying to your spirit that you're a child of God. And in the Galatians church, they were trying to bring in circumcision. And in other churches today, they'll expect to see your good works as evidence. You know, and both are looking for that outward sign in the flesh. You know, so good works can be an evidence of a believer having faith, 
But a believer without works still has faith. It's just dead and unprofitable. So in James chapter 2, in verse 14, it says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give him none of those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So the faith is there, but it's just alone. And your works are not to justify yourself before God, but they're there to profit others. You know, so that's the purpose of your works, is to show the love of God. All your works show is that you love God and you want to please him. It does not show a person's salvation. You know, because that's the circumcision made without hands, and only the Lord can see that. So in James, if you turn to James, we're still in James 2, verse 18. It says, yes, a man, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But our Father, but would thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou that faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only? Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers, and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So works make our faith perfect, that means complete or entire. But works of faith are of the spirit, not of the flesh. They are done in the new man, and they're of faith, and that's why they please God, because without faith it's impossible to please him. And they profit other people that they might be able to see our faith through our works. You know, but our works do not justify us in any way before God, only before man. We saw that in Romans 4 earlier. So we're going to move to Galatians 3 now, if you want to turn there. Reading from verse 1. That's Galatians 3. So Galatians 3, verse 1, it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? So again, he's saying, how did they receive it? It says in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you in the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and was accounted to him for righteousness. So even the miracles that the apostles were doing were by the Spirit, not by the law. That's not how you're perfected. It's not even our works. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the Holy Ghost and the new man, the new creature, that perfects our faith. Now, you don't begin in the Spirit and perfect your faith in the flesh. But rather, the flesh is crucified with Christ. The Spirit perfects your faith through faith. And in Galatians 2, as we saw before, it's called the faith of Christ and the faith of the Son of God. It's his faith. It's not our faith that keeps us. We'll see that in 1 Peter 1 as well. If you want to catch up, it's 1 Peter 1 verse 3. It says, Blessed be the, Lord, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So how are we kept? Are we kept through our works, through the works of the law, through the works of our flesh? We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We're kept by the Holy Ghost inside of us, we're kept by Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's how we're saved. You know, so it's proof that it's the Holy Ghost who keeps us and seals us under the day of redemption. I'm not kept by my works. It's God alone that assures my resurrection. 
It's his power, his word, his promise. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And John 10.28 says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We're kept by the Son, we're kept by the Father. We're not kept by our works. So we'll uh, get you to turn to Hebrews 11. We're going to read through about the first half of the chapter, I think. But there's a reason it's known as a faith chapter in the Hall of Faith. It's not called the works chapter or the Hall of Works. You know, it's not about their works. And none of these Old Testament people were justified by their works. It was all by faith. And they were all showing their great faith of the Spirit by their works. And the only reason they did these things is because they already believed in the Lord. And we can see that their faith, you can see the faith by their works. But again, just because someone doesn't have works, it doesn't mean they're not saved and they don't have faith. So in Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto us a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated so he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we know all these men before, before with Enoch and Abel and Abraham, they all understood the Lord. They believed on him, and they understood he's a rewarder of them that seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet not seen as yet, moved with fear, became an ark, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now Pastor Kevin preached on this as well about how they're looking to the heavenly kingdom of Zion, the city of Jerusalem, the one built by God. You know, they, it wasn't about the physical land and it wasn't about the physical seed. It was, the seed was Christ and the bride is the city. And that's what it was all about. It's what it's always been about. Uh, 11 verse 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprung there even of one, and by him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. And that's us. Because we're in Christ, this is us. You know, that innumerable, innumerable number, um, that, that multitude is us. And that's, you know, we're going to be in heaven one day as part of the kingdom of God. You know, and these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You know, so all, again, all these were saved by their faith, and they knew that. And they were, they were persuaded of that, and they embraced that. You know, they weren't trusting in their works. They were working out their faith. Just as we're all commanded to do, they all died in faith, working out their faith, according to the new man and not according to the flesh. So uh, 1 John chapter 4, you know, because we're also commanded to try the spirits. And after that, we'll be going to 1 John 3. So 1 John 4 verse 1. Actually, I'll just take a drink. So we do need to try the spirits. So it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world, and hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, 
whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we'll go to First John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth not us, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So again, this comes back to the things we haven't seen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen Christ. We don't know what he looks like, but we know we're going to look like him at the appearing. When he comes back, he's going to conform us to his image. You know, that much we do know. It says we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And this is why I hate when people play on the words like repent of your sins. Now, like sin is a transgression of the law, so it, and it is a work of the law. When you repent of your sins for salvation, that's a work of the law. You know, and that's something we should do. I'll bring that up in a little bit because David brings that up as well in chapter 32. But that's, some, that's not something you do for salvation. Uh, where are we? And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So again, we know the new man, the new creature, he's perfect. He's born of God and he does not sin. This is the seed of God. And he also doeth, he loves his brother and he doeth righteousness. So if you walk after the new man, men can see your faith. And that's how we try the spirits. If they're of God, they will testify of God. And those that bring another gospel or another Jesus, they have not the spirit of God. And this will be manifest. So this brings up a third point. Uh, the old man, the corrupt flesh, he does sin daily. Um, so after you've received the imputed righteousness of Christ and the new man, you still should confess your sins daily to the Lord for fellowship, you know, to keep a clean account with the Father. Um, if you want the Lord to consider you a friend, so first you must believe on him and be a child of God. Um, but you also need to confess your sins to him. It says the Lord is faithful and will forgive all your sins in the flesh if you confess them to him, because Christ is our mediator. So back in Psalm 32 verse 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, Then this is the message we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, this is not what saves us, this is just for fellowship with the Lord. Um, but it's still something we must do every day because we still have that sinful flesh. So um, we'll get back to the previous point on that, um, about the false teachers and the false brethren. So in Psalm 2, I'll just reread the first two verses. 
It says, uh, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So in John chapter 1, I'll get you to turn, turn there, John chapter 1 verse 45. So we see another man who has, in whom is no guile. So it says, Philip find Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found of him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So even again, you know, Philip is coming here and said, look, we found the guy who Moses was writing about. The guy, you know, the guy who all the prophets, Abra from Abel to Zechariah, they all wrote of Jesus Christ. He's saying, look, we found the guy. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael come unto him and said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. So I believe this is, this is twofold. He's an Israelite indeed because he's both of the blood of Abraham, but he's also of the spirit of Abraham. But he also says, In whom is no guile. And Nath Nathanael saith unto him, Whence is knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. So again, if they didn't understand about the Son of God, how is Nathanael going to understand this? How is he going to know he's the Son of God? Because the Old Testament prophets all understood he was the Son of God. He's always been the Son of God from eternity past. And, and well, the definition of guile is like sly or cunning craftiness. You know, so these are the false brethren and the false teachers who are out to deceive you. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read verse 13. It says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So that's exactly what we saw in the Galatian church. And Paul's warning the Ephesians as well. So it would be good for us to also take heed of this warning. In 2 Peter 1 verse 16 it says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So not being cunning or crafty means you're being honest and speaking the truth. And these men were giving a true report of the, the eyewitness of Christ. But there were men who were not giving a true report. These, these men have guile. You know, and these are those who are teaching another gospel. You know, they're trying to deceive, deceive you and they will use cunning craftiness. You know, and that's not what we do as children of the light. We speak openly and truthfully of the wonderful grace of God and his mercy to all who believe. So just let the same be said of you. You know, believe on the Lord and you're a Jew according to the Spirit. You know, the circumcision of the heart made without hands and in whom is no guile. You know, that's the imputed righteousness of Christ. But it's also something you can only do if you're walking in the Spirit after that new incorruptible man and perfecting your faith through the Spirit. And when it comes to these people, I don't have any mercy for them. I do, it doesn't matter who they are. You know, they're an enemy of the cross of Christ and God's no respecter of persons. That's why we read in Galatians 2, 6, but these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they seem to be somewhat in conference, added nothing to me. So we don't care who they are. You know, if they're teaching another gospel, let them be accursed. If they add works to salvation or works after salvation, that's another gospel. So in Galatians 1.6, we already read, but I'll read it again. It says, I marvel that you so soon removed with him from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So again, it's not a brand new gospel. It's still a gospel according to Jesus, but they're always adding and perverting it to be something else. That's always what it is. You know, it says that but we, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you 
than that you have received, let him be accursed. So again, we see that's the Mormons. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Muslims. You know, an angel comes to you and gives you another revelation, gives you another gospel, let them be accursed. If they don't teach the gospel according to sound doctrine that they left us, it's a false gospel. So in, in 2 John 1 verse 7, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So again, that's about trying the spirits. He doesn't have God because he doesn't have the Son and he doesn't have the Spirit. He hasn't believed. It says, He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there can come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And it's not just about house, but what about the house of God? Like, are you going to let these people into the house of God? You know, I wouldn't even let them into my house. You know, so why would we let them into the house of God? You know, so these men with guile, the false brethren and false teachers, you, you not only want to avoid them, but to have no fellowship with them and not even bless or accept them. And certainly don't accept their person just because of who they are. You know, if there's someone you know, it could be a famous preacher like Billy Graham or, you know, um, Kenneth Copeland or any of these, you know, the wicked false prophets, don't respect their person just because of who they are and what they have. You know, and you might even say, well, this guy's right on a few things, but he's not right about the gospel. The Bible says that let him be accursed. You know, don't bear with him at all, not even for an hour. You know, they're liars and deceivers and they're enemies of God. So here in John chapter 6, you know, I'll get you to turn there, read from verse 60. You know, Jesus explained in parables, in order to be saved, to receive eternal life, you must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, which is, being, is metaphorical for the bread of life, the manner of God, the word of God, which is Christ Jesus and the death of his body. And the blood represents the cleansing of our sins through the shedding of his blood on the cross. Now, so this is what Christ says about these parables. In John 6, verse 60, he says, Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up from where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are lie. But there are many of you that deceive, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Of course, that was Judas. So your flesh in regard to salvation profits you absolutely nothing. It's the spirit, it's the word, it's your faith in the word that saves you. It says, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You know, so it's the words of God, the word of God that saves us if we believe on it. And the false brethren, what they're doing with, is with their mouth they give lip service to, oh yeah, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Yeah, I believe it's just by faith alone. But then they're waving the filthy rags of their righteousness in front of God and saying, accept these. You know, I, I say, let them be accursed. You know, and that's exactly what these repentant sins, false brethren, are doing. That's what the faith plus baptism, false brethren and false teachers are doing. That's what the faith plus your works keep you saved, false brethren are doing. You know, they wave the filthy rags around like they mean anything. You know, it's only faith in Jesus Christ that saves you. It's only your faith that justifies you. You know, so to receive eternal life, you must humble yourself and place all your trust in Jesus Christ, and his righteousness will save you. So once you believe on the Lord, your sins are remitted, and your iniquities are, for, are remembered no more. They're forgiven. And what a blessing that is for us. You know, so be sure to confess your sins to the Father daily, but also thank him for his mercy and long-suffering toward us. And for all those who teach another Jesus or another gospel, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. In other words, let him be accursed. 